Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemroff and welcome back to Collider Best of the Week, the place to go if you don't have time to watch all the videos on the Collider Videos YouTube channel or to read all the articles on Collider.com and you want it all in one nice neat little package. And of course, it's still for you folks who want to relive some of our best moments, our best discussions, and of course, biggest screw ups. So first up today, we're going to move over to movie talk for one of the big pieces of news that dropped this week. It is Tom Hiddleston's potential casting as the new James Bond. Let's see what the panel thought about that one. Uh, I think he's a great actor. He, he has just all those different dimensions to him. Uh, he's done incredible Shakespeare where he, he can memorize things. He's in, memorized entire books. I don't have any problems with him at all playing James Bond. In fact, I'm glad that Mendes is, is uh, not continuing because I didn't like Spectre. I thought Skyfall was fantastic. I think they they you know fumbled with Spectre, and I think Daniel Craig is tired of being Bond. It's apparent with all of his complaining about it. I know that the Broccoli's are very you know they control this franchise very closely, um, but I I sincerely think that it would behoove them to maybe think outside the box in terms of going forward. The other thing on that topic that I wanted to point out: Gillian Anderson threw her name into the mix to play a Bond type character or but play Bond herself. And while Gillian Anderson is is not English or European. Amelia Clark, our favorite Khaleesi, uh, threw her name into the mix as well. And I understand if you guys are not gonna be okay with Lady Ghostbusters and a Lady James Bond in one year, I get that. But I think these types of conversations are kind of cool. And I would definitely like to see an Amelia Clark James Bond, Jane Bond. I think it's fun to banter around who you think would be a good James Bond and if they wanted to do something very, very different with the franchise. But I also think that Tom Hiddleston is the right choice to be playing James Bond going forward where, yeah, I think it's great to have more diversity in film, but with a character like James Bond, if you want to go back to a more classic looking Bond, the guy that we came to know from the Sean Connery and Roger Moore days, then Tom Hiddleston should be your man. We also had some casting news for Captain Marvel this week and I was so excited that I happened to be on the movie talk panel when that happened. Brie Larson is currently in talks for the title role in the movie and there's also some talk of the director as well and Jennifer Kent who's the director behind the Babadook is in the mix and I am so pumped about that. When we started talking about this like who we thought would be be playing she was kind of on top of the list for me especially after seeing room you and i both loved room i i also thought emily blunt was going to get it at one point but then it just started you started these rumors started happening and and i think i mentioned yesterday with el Miembe who had broke the planet whole thing i think he, that they talked about this too so he's on a hot streak right mm -hmm. now but i think that this particular thing will happen it should happen she's young enough to make to kind of continue on because we don't know what's going to happen past the infinity wars and where they're going to continue the storylines and who's going to be in the spotlight and you would assume Captain Marvel would, would be one of them sure. so I think she's absolutely someone that can play the role and I think it's smart for them to lock her in I think she's a great actress and now she's an Oscar winner so it's like Marvel keeps just getting these amazing actors and actresses to play their characters and I think Brie Larson is a perfect fit for uh, Carol Danvers so I know we had, we'd been you know a lot of uh, on the hero show we'd like been speculating who's it going to be Emily Blunt but L Brie Larson was right there with the uh, speculation because she she seems to fit in and I think she'll bring that extra you know energy to it. Short Term 12 is available on Netflix now so mm -hmm. if you need a little more convincing if the Oscar isn't already doing it for you go on Netflix watch Short Term 12 because she's incredible in that she's got Kong Skull Island coming out mm -hmm. so I'm kind of right. curious to see how she fits into a bigger production like that and if I mean I have no doubt in my mind that she can carry a film but carrying a film carrying an independent film is a little different than carrying a universe like this with so much more going on you're right uh, we don't we haven't seen Brie Larson lead a big budget film she's certainly been in it with the 21 Jump Street as mm -hmm. well but wasn't a lead in that one but I think that it's not gonna be a problem I think it's gonna transfer over I think those smaller films actually help because of what she's gonna be able to do and bring to the character so I, I, I think this is gonna happen and I think it should happen Let's move over to a Thor Ragnarok story making the rounds right now. Joe Blow claims to know how Planet Hulk is going to be incorporated in that film. Oh, and Chris Hemsworth might have to shave his head too. I believe that we're going to actually see elements from the Planet Hulk story. It makes the most sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense for them to do this. We've been talking about how he's going to be challenged a lot more in this different, you know, not being on Earth. So I absolutely think it's going to happen. I think it's been talked about more. And I think with the success of Guardians of the Galaxy, they made, it made it more realistic that they could do something like this. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to happen. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, I mean, you look at Marvel's latest comic books over the last like ten years. You have Battle World, you have New Secret Wars, you have Planet Hulk, you have World War World War Hulk. You've got all these different uh, you know planets with superheroes thrown on them, and they've got to do battle. So I think this is the perfect way to bring in Thor with Ragnarok and make Hulk a larger part of the the film. The weirdest thing that I thought was like they were like, and Thor will have short hair. It's like it's when fantastic. Metallica cut their hair. We know he, he's <laughs> Thor. He's got to have long hair, man. It doesn't make sense otherwise. Let's move on over to Heroes right now, where the big topic on the show was this twist that Steve Rogers is a Hydra operative. Everyone had a lot to say about this topic, but get ready for a lot of Amy in this segment because she made some really good points about why people are having such a big reaction to this news. This has happened throughout all of history. It's it's awesome when it happens, and you guys all just got sucked into it. You got played like the suckers. Captain America is not a double agent working for Hydra. There's a twist that is coming in this series and everyone's being very reactionary. Like while while a twist where you work for your worst enemy is perfectly standard comic book stuff, because Hydra, while not explicitly Nazism, has a long history of being linked to fascist ideologies, there are people who are like, this idea makes me uncomfortable. And I kind of respect that. Mm -hmm. Even in this issue, they show you a scene of like a Hydra recruiter using sort of weird right-wing dialogue to get like a, a dispossessed person on his side and it's actually this really interesting sympathetic portrayal of like getting sucked into these hate movements right so they're very aware that that's the thing they're talking about uh and i can't really blame someone who's like this is not for me i don't want to look at an alternate version where cat believes this even for a second on the other hand you are right it's totally normal comic book stuff We've also got a topic on Jedi Council this week that's making people a little crazy right now and definitely way too crazy than you should be. So news broke that Rogue One is getting some reshoots this summer and then we found out that Disney wants these reshoots to happen because they want the movie to feel less like a war movie and more like one of the original Star Wars films. Now, that might sound like a big deal, but I must reiterate, reshoots are a very normal thing. So don't get too carried away and the panel's gonna talk about that as well. So let's jump into it. Big budget films plan in advance and budget for in advance periods for reshooting. Why? Because something that is written out on the page, you don't always know what that's really going to look like when it's on the screen. And you don't really know how it's going to turn out once you start cutting it together. The reports that I kind of believe, the reports that I kind of believe are that the executives saw it, thought it was really dark in a way that to be fair, at Star Wars Celebration, Gareth Edwards said, this is going to be a war film because it's called Star Wars. They brought in guys from Saving Private Ryan, and they brought in guys from Black Hawk Down, um, and they brought all, and, and Zero Dark Thirty, they brought these guys, so what did you expect? So when you see the movie, and then they're trying to toning it down and apparently giving more for Darth Vader to do, that I'm cool with, but if the reports are true, that they're scaling down, or they're, they're trying to make it lighter in tone to fix more of the Star Wars feel from the past. That scares me a bit because I'm okay personally, although I understand the wide marketability, I guess, but I see personally as a Star Wars fan, I like the idea of seeing this <clears throat> war movie, a different tone. Take the shot. Go ballsy. It's a standalone movie. I have worry because I wanted a dark, gritty Star Wars. Give me that. I don't need the jokes. I don't need the levity. I want to see darkness. And I think it's important to use these particular movies, these uh, Star Wars story movies, to do that because you can bring in different directors to bring different points of views and expand the universe, the possibility of the universe, like the extent, like the uh, like the novels did that weren't canon officially. Whatever they said, the Legends novels they expanded the universe, and not a lot of them had. Legends either they were very dark and explored these darker regions of the universe and I and I was hoping to see more of that I get it I'm just we still worried. might yeah and, and I get I, it I don't think it's mutually exclusive but, I, mean, no, I don't think it's one or the other absolutely it's fair my, my concern is if you're gonna make the Star Wars story films the same as the Star Wars trilogy films then there's no difference and that's what I worry about We've got three new wide releases hitting theaters this weekend and junket interviews for two of them first up pop star never stop never stopping took me a little while, but I got it. Let's check out Haley Fouch's interview with The Lonely Island, during which she spoke about all the original music they had to come up with for the film. How many songs did you guys write that ultimately didn't make it into the movie? Uh, well, tons. tons. I think there's three full ones and then extended versions of a lot of stuff that is in the movie, probably like four or five of those that are gonna be on the soundtrack. 
but there's three like full great songs. But just in gen- we, but the even more general yeah. answer is just like let's say fifty or sixty would be my guess. Yeah, we wrote wow. a ton. Like we, a we ton. just wrote a ton of songs. Some of them we wouldn't get all the way through. You know, you get about up to the first chorus and go, no, nah, that one's not going to really work, and you put it aside. I say wrote- forty. 40 total? I don't know. I bet you if we went into that thing of, of, of ones that we stopped midway and stuff, yeah. it might be more like 50 or 60. Okay. That 50 or 60. It sounds more impressive. Expecting. Yeah, we made yeah, a we did. A, we started a lot. We've gotten to the point where if something's not working, we can identify it pretty early and bail. Yeah. Nice. Um, but, but, there yeah was, but the soundtrack, to his point, so yeah. the soundtrack has like five or six other songs, one that even has Akon on it, that oh, is cool. was one of our favorites and just didn't have a place within the story. Now moving over to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. Our own Justine Browning got the opportunity to talk to the guys who play Bebop and Rocksteady, and they are an absolute delight in the movie. Their energy is super infectious, so we want to share a clip from her interview where you can feel a little bit of that energy. The first scene we did, we're in the convoy truck, you know, just talking back and forth, and we just, you know, and then the the lines we had in the dialogue, like, He'd go off and improv and I'd feed off him a bit, you know, we just bounce off each other. And with the voiceover stuff too, like being with him, like, and just talking back, like bouncing off each other. So easy, I learned so much from Gary, you know what I mean? I, I think the, the improv thing obviously definitely paid off in this because they really encouraged improv in it. Yeah. I mean, they had a great script and then both producer and director would, would feed, feed your lines like, oh, try, or, or just try something different this take, or they would open with a totally improvised take even. So they really allowed us to really play, which yeah. I think really helped those two guys, you know, that friendship they have, you know. And Drew, yeah. Drew would throw lines too, you know, hey, try this, and, and Dave, yeah. they come in, try this line, try that line, you know. And uh, we just spitball stuff, and, and, and a lot of stuff actually stuck really well. Yeah. Over on TV Talk, the panel spoke about a show that I'm really looking forward to. It's HBO's Westworld. That one has hit quite a few bumps in the road along the way, but HBO finally made the announcement that it is going to start fall 2016. So let's see what the crew thought about that. The film that came back out in the 70s, I believe, Michael Crichton's first uh, directorial debut, the guy who wrote Jurassic Park, for those of you not aware of this, uh, James Brolin, Yul Brenner. It's a very simple film. People who have money go to this, uh, I don't know, Disneyland for adults, and you have some themes. There's a West world. There's like a, a Roman world. There's all these California places. Adventure California Adventure. Yeah, you can basically go <laughs> and just kind of live out your fantasies. You know, you can have sex and, you know, do, you know, with sex bots. There's always sex bots. Got to have sex bots. Of course. Um, Obviously. What's so, the future without a sex but bot? But this is going to go, I think, a lot deeper. <laughs> I mean, it's going to explore, like, the birth of artificial intelligence and all this kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm so pumped about it. This is right up my alley. You have here two of my favorite genres. When True Grit came out, I want to say, like, four or five years ago, I was like, oh, we're going to start seeing Westerns. We're going to start seeing the rebirth of Westerns. It's such a fantastic genre mm-hmm. to imbue that with a sci-fi edge. And I'm hoping this goes kind of in that like ex machina vein. I think this is going to be fantastic. Yes, the cast is great. I actually was talking to John Schnepp about this because me and my friends are planning on rewatching the film and Schnepp was like, eh, it doesn't really hold up. But that is the perfect property. Mm-hmm. When you have a pedigree, when you have a great underlying concept and then you have a film that maybe has sort of fallen behind what we expect now from our entertainment, I am so grateful to see that this is finally living because there was a chance that yeah. they were going to shelve this the, thing. The one thing Game of Thrones did really well for HBO was prove that they can spend big budgets on uh, like an expansive universe kind of mm-hmm. thing like Lord of the Rings and get the return that they wanted, which I think they were a little apprehensive about because if you look at the budgets from the first season of Game of Thrones, they are nothing like what they are for right mm-hmm. now and nothing for what we're going to see in six and seven. So... That being said, I think we're gonna get some unbelievably dynamic TV. Before we wrap up the TV talk section this week, we wanna show you a little bit of Sasha and Josh's interview with Anya Buckstein, who's playing the Red Priestess Kinvara on Game of Thrones. So let's check out a little bit of that. I remember, you know, taping and then like retaping because it was so important. <laughs> and then Obviously, you let go. You don't think about it anymore. And suddenly, it it came back to me, which was what amazing. What was that phone call? What did they say when they called you and said, this is your job? And what was your reaction to that? Well, exactly as you said it, Anya, you got the job. <laughs> and it was just straight from tape. You didn't have to go and test for producers and no, nothing? No, no. And then I think we danced at home. <laughs> I think we danced. Could you give me and a I rendition think, of that dance? Oh, no, that no, dance no. Like, that's, huh? that's going to yeah. be embarrassing. 
Let's move on over to the Collider.com portion of the show, the time when we get to highlight some written features done by the incredible staff over there. And we're going to kick things off with some X-Men Apocalypse articles. And we're doing this because now that the movie has come out, we can have a more in-depth conversation about certain things that happen in that film. That being said, be warned, there are some spoilers in these articles. Let's start with Adam Chitwood's piece about the X-Men Apocalypse post credit scene. Sadly, the press screening didn't include it, but Adam had the opportunity to check it out. And in this article, he breaks down exactly what you're seeing, particularly when it comes to the new character it teases and how it paves the way towards another X-Men film. Next, if you're having a tough time wrapping your head around the X-Men timeline, especially after the events of Days of Future Past, Nick Romano has a great piece up that runs through the films and makes some interesting arguments about what information and events could still be in play. And lastly, for X-Men coverage, we've got nine major unanswered questions from X-Men Apocalypse by Haley Fouch, in which she pulls everything together and addresses that post credit scene, where Apocalypse leaves us in terms of the X-Men timeline, and also poses some questions to spark conversation regarding the future of specific characters in the series. Not only is Brie Larson in early talks to star, but there's also some rumblings regarding the possible director of the film, with Jennifer Kent and Nikki Caro's names being thrown out there. While we wait for the official word on who gets the gig from Marvel, Collider.com brings the question to you. Take our poll and cast your vote on who you think should direct the film. There are some great options in there, but I've definitely got a thing for the Babadook, so Kent got my vote. Moving over to the DC films, Collider got a really cool opportunity this week. We got to debut the Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice Ultimate Edition trailer. It's a great promo that'll get you pumped for the 182 minute cut of the film. So be sure to check that out on Collider.com. And then you can also navigate over to the June 2nd episode of Movie Talk to hear the panel's thoughts on it. Let's stick with superheroes, but move it on over to TV shows. I just binged Arrow, and I'm currently making my way through Flash, but at this point, watching those two shows is only scratching the surface. Evan Valentine, however, has seen all of this year's superhero shows, and he ranked them from Heroes Reborn all the way up to... You'll have to read the article to see what came in at number one. We've also got a new set visit report for you this week, and this is actually my own. Two years ago, I got the chance to visit the Vancouver set of monster trucks. Whether you had fun with the film's first trailer or not, it was an especially exciting set to be on because it's a completely original idea, and I stepped onto set knowing absolutely nothing about the film, which really doesn't happen too often. Right now, we've got on-set interviews with director Chris Wedge, producer Mary Perrin, and star Lucas Till all up and running, but there's more on the way. If seeing pop star Never Stop Never Stopping is a priority for you this week, you're going to want to check out Adam's Lonely Island feature. He picked the 10 best Lonely Island sketches, including some well-known digital shorts and some of their earlier material from before their SNL days. And lastly, for Collider.com, this isn't really a feature, but it's something going on that you're going to want to check out. You know how it's tough to get a Comic-Con badge and super expensive to book a trip? Well, we're going to give away a badge and a trip to San Diego for the event. It's super easy to enter. Just head on over to Collider.com and follow the instructions there by June 30th. On this week's Schmodown, the Outlaw takes on the Wild Man. John Roca starts this match unranked thanks to a certain question that's going to haunt him forever probably, while Josh McCuga starts the match at number eight. Will Mance versus Roca number two ever happen? Let's get a preview and see if that's how things can pan out. Listen, this is a, a match a long time coming. For some reason, Roca has it out for me. I have no idea why he wants to challenge me. He thinks he should have been the TV talk host. He can't hold a show. I barely let him do The Walking Dead. I felt bad. You gotta give me a break with this Makuga guy talking all this jealousy crap. Are you kidding? What am I jealous of? Huh? Ugly stubble? What am I jealous of? Huh? Those fat arms of his? What am I jealous of? Those pink pants that no man in his right straight mind would wear? What am I jealous of? With a record of three wins, two defeats, the... Big wardrobe, Christian. He brought along his teammate, Finstock. What a surprise for these audience members. Representing Park Unknown, he is the outlaw, John Roca. Look at all the plastic surgery he got since the last time. He clearly is embarrassed about his best been gas, and he does not want to be recognized. No, In which state does Adam Sandler attend college? in the water boy. Oh, 
Oh, crap. Crap is not correct. Oh. Not one of the 50 states, I believe, Christian. Not anymore, anyway. Oh, God. <laughs> Five. Four. Uh, Louisiana. Correct. Oh. Three guesses. What a man. sandbag and you know dog okay. no, guesses. Just, hold on. Now we go into movie taglines, Josh. This is the last Give question, and it would really help if you got this correct. He needs it. Yes. Every man dies, not every man really lives, is the tagline of which film? <laughs> is it Braveheart? It is Braveheart. Braveheart. Give All that right. man a point. As I mentioned last week, Meme of the Week is taking a little break, but that's because we have something really cool we want to share with you right now. If you've been watching Movie Talk, you know that we announced our horror show called Collider Nightmares. Kicks off on June 7th, and we're pretty much prepared for it, except for one big thing, a theme song. One of my really good friends from high school, Ryan Colt Levy, is a really talented musician, and he's also a really big fan of the channel, so he volunteered to help us come with an original theme for the show. Now, what we want to do right now is bring you three options that he came up with, and how this is going to work is you're going to go over to Collider.com after, and you're going to vote on which one you want best. So let's give these tracks a listen. Here's option one. And option two. And finally, option three. There you have it. Those are your options for the Collider Nightmares theme songs. If you need help navigating on over to the Collider.com article, which has the poll in it, check my Twitter feed, or you can check the description section of this post. You have to cast your vote by 5 p.m. PST on Monday night, and then we're going to reveal which one was picked on the first episode the next day, Tuesday, June 7th. Please be sure to tune in for that. It's going to be great. And also, if you really dig these songs, I highly recommend checking out Ryan's music with his band Braves. Just go to Braves.com and you can catch it all there. All right, so now let's go over to bloopers, which at this point needs no introduction. So let's roll it. Do you know what the penis said when it got thrown on the fire? <laughs> yeah, what did the penis say? What did the penis say? say when it got thrown on the fire? Star Wars News Net reports that The Force Awakens screenwriter is in the hallway and they're just making so much noise because they're excited. And playing with the history in interesting ways. This isn't doing that. <laughs> he has to go fight these games to put him by the Grand Master, but then Thor, they gotta get these infinity stones from Thanos. It's like, you know, all nerds you know, don't talk geez. like that, Mark Ellis. Is this the butthole face show? It's just recording that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Nurse. <laughs> I wanna love you and hug you and squeeze you forever and ever and ever. That you can get from the title. You know what I'm saying? Well, but I also got it from the trailer. <laughs> Spit your water somewhere safe. <laughs> Makugas? Council, I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Harloff Minor, and it is time for our show about Star Wars. This is where we talk about everything that is absolutely... Again with the Harloff Minor. That's the name. <laughs> Always with the... <laughs> That's the name. Minor. Well, nah, nah, blah, blah. Don't really care about Mary Poppins at all. But, I mean, look, the talent involved in there. I don't. I, uh, I, look, I grew up watching Mary Poppins when I was a kid. And Julie they Andrews call me the dream crusher. And stay off my lawn. <laughs> if you were a guessing person, if let's just put you in a penis, what would what would you scream as a penis on the fire? Please no. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Apparently, Fama, you are. Oh, uh, I had it. I just got scared. <laughs> scared. Fama, you are. Fama, you are. Well, you weren't Harloff Minor five weeks ago. To clarify, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Maybe people shouldn't talk so fucking weird. 
like All so right, exciting and great Anya show, Bookstein. really. Nope. Oh, there we go. Oh, that was our interview with Anya Bookstein. Guys, I'm sure that will make it in Best of the Week. Period. We're offering one very lucky Collider reader and a guest of their choosing a free trip to San, Gie San Diego. <laughs> We're offering one... <laughs> We're offering one very collider. <laughs> You're very colliding. <laughs> Bathroom, gotta pee. Oh, I gotta pee. It's a little creepy that Scorsese is looking at me right now. Has that always been there? <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> but is it though? Because that was weird. <laughs> Did I say something funny again? Go this back is to the out of character Ooh. for somebody named Obi John Kenobi. I know. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side, you prick. And I'm ah, a dick. Bye. I'm a dick nah. for hating Mary Poppins. I'm a dick. Ah, charge back. Yeah, just double tap it again. That's a wrap on this week's Collider Best of the Week. You guys know what to do. Hit the comments section below and tell us your favorite moments from this week's lineup of shows. You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNemroff. Be sure to go and bookmark Collider.com. Subscribe to the Collider Videos YouTube channel. Watch and read everything, but just in case you don't have time, that's what Best of the Week is for. Have a good weekend, everyone. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.